flavour of what the research has come up with before we launch, uh, publish our report in October. We've, we've been also very fortunate to have with us today, um, to have with us today, health economist Frank Grimsey Jones, who was seconded from Simitron, a commercial company, um, to Wyme over the last six months. He's really brought uh, rigor, expertise and um, research to, to, this, um, to this piece of work. We've also got a panel of experts uh, with academic, economic and practical experience of the implementation of restorative justice who've advised and supported us. And we'll be asking them to, uh, inviting them to talk to you later on in this session. It runs until four o'clock, there will be a break in the middle, but we're going to record this event if you don't wish uh, your face to be recorded or your voice, then please turn them off. So right now in the chat, which is on the little bar, um, the speech bubble, I invite you to add your name, your role, your organisation into the chat so we can get a flavour of who's in the room. And also, what's your interest in restorative justice? So that's your name, your role and your organisation into the chat. Uh, and what's your interest or experience uh, of restorative justice? So I'll just give you a moment to do that. Great, thank you. Oh, David, lovely to see you. And Phil, that means I can, I know who's in the room as well. And Simon, yeah, I saw you, fantastic. Will Jacks, one of our trustees, really, really great to have you here. Lovely. Right, so let's get cracking. What is restorative justice uh, and what do we do at Why Me? Well, Why Me was set up 12 years ago by Will Riley, who was attacked and burgled in his home. He met the man who did that, Peter Wolfe, and then he went on to found Why Me because he, he felt and experienced restorative justice as a completely transformative tool. For both men, it was transformative. So Peter, who'd been committing crime since he was a young man, a young boy, in fact, sort of never, has never taken drugs or, or committed any crime since that day. And Will went on to found Why Me? Because for people who are harmed by crime, it is, is a really fantastic way of getting their voices heard, telling their stories and really moving on with their lives. So our mission is to widen access to everyone affected by crime and conflict at the time they need it. We're a leading restorative justice organisation in the UK. We work globally. We promote restorative justice alongside people directed, directly affected by crime, and we build evidence through our own development work alongside police and crime commissioners and youth offending teams. And we work with decision makers to ensure that policy and legislation support wider access to restorative justice. And we also run our own registered high quality restorative justice service in house. Um, I'm now having really inspired you about what restorative justice and why me does i really invite you uh with, this is a free event however everything we do costs money if you can contribute to helping us to continue our work this isn't your only opportunity um but there's going to be a link in the chat if you can donate very very grateful to those who've already donated but if you can make a contribution today it means we can carry on doing our work which is so important to make this uh, this world a better place but also life better for victims and offenders so the purpose today what we're going to talk about is e economic evaluation of restorative justice the social benefits of restorative justice are well known and there's a growing body of evidence about the qualitative and quantitative impact of restorative justice. However, at Why Me, we are acutely aware of the need to provide evidence of the economic value of restorative justice, to sit alongside these powerful testimonies and really strong research, so that people responsible for making difficult decisions about which approach to invest in, how to invest government money so that we all benefit, have a robust economic basis on which to make those decisions. So this economic evaluation project conducted a rigorous evaluation of the costs and benefits of restorative justice. It's targeted informing national and local decision making around funding, 
and the implementation of restorative justice. Not only will there be a research paper, but there's also an economic model which is designed to be used practically by commissioners of services. I'm now, um, sorry, uh, for commissioners of reduction and reoffending programs, rehabilitation, and victim coping and recovery um, programs and services. We're first going to hear from Frank Grimsey Jones and then from our panel of experts. In the room today supporting this, we also have Lucy Harris, who's been the research assistant on the economic evaluation project, and Kiva Baxter, who is our communications officer supporting tech on the event today. So please mute yourselves. We will break at 2.50 for 10 minutes and then we'll come back at three for a panel uh, to hear from our panel. Um, so I'm now going to hand over to Frank to um, present the research. That's great. Can everyone see those slides? Yes. OK, fantastic. I'm so excited to be speaking to you today uh, about this research that we've been conducting with YME. Um, and as Lucy said, there's going to be two parts of the session. So there's going to be a presentation from me at the start and then a panel discussion in the second half. Uh, and my slides are divided up, so I'm going to start by talking about some background to the research. I'll talk about the methods we've used, give a summary of the results, and then talk through some of the findings. So the first, the economics of prison. Reoffending rates are incredibly high. So even within the first year after the sentence, um, there's an average of a quarter of offenders proven to reoffend. And for theft, that rises to, to um, around half. So really high rates of proven reoffending, with a number of proven reoffences a proven reoffender. Crime is very expensive, it has a very large economic impact, and prison is very expensive. So we've got two pieces of home office research at the top there, looking at um, the, the economic impact of crime overall as £60 billion per year, but also of reoffending as £18 billion per year. So a very, very high proportion of the total economic impact of crime is associated with short-term reoffending. Um, Prison is a big part of that. So the, the direct financial costs of prisons to the state every year is five and a half billion, much, much larger than the total spend on victim services. Um, and also as a point of reference, more money than is being spent on the early years. Um, but actually that money is being spent on, on quite a small group of people. So only 0.1% of the population are, are in prison, um, but it's very, very expensive to keep them there. Early intervention, um, so that's, uh, is all about working out whether it's worth uh, an investment now in order to achieve economic benefits later on or avoid costs later on. Um, public spending is distributed very unevenly. So uh, this is kind of not drawn to scale, but if we were to draw the distribution of public spending across the population, it would look something like this, with a very small group of people receiving a very large um, share of public spending. And that's because when people enter a state of dependency on the public sector, that's incredibly expensive. So whether that's people in prisons, people in nursing homes, uh, children's homes, there's small mi minorities of people who receive very, very large amounts of public spending. And any interventions that can help those people towards independence can be associated with very, very large economic impacts for society, as well as for those individuals. Um, and so when people think about prevention, they're often thinking about um, kind of population level interventions, so public health, healthy eating, um, very, very broad interventions. But actually, there's often a very, very strong economic case for targeted interventions that helps a group of people avoid an expensive state of dependency. Um, so right at the top of the prevention pyramid. And that's, that's a way of thinking about restorative justice. So restorative justice is all about dialogue between harmed and harmer. It's an opportunity for people to ask questions and have those questions answered and to understand the events that have taken place. It can be via a face to face meeting, um, but it can also be um, indirect RJ. We'll talk more about that later. Um, there's been a, a real wealth of, of research, of policy and of practice development uh, over the years about RJ. It's received substantial attention. Um, and indeed, uh, victims have a right to be told about RJ as part of the, the victim's code of practice. But only 5% of victims recall ever having been told about RJ, let alone having the opportunity to access it. So there's a long way to go in terms of widening access to restorative justice to allow victims and offenders and society to benefit from the approach. This research is all about synthesizing the existing research 
within a cost benefit framework to understand the economic impacts of restorative justice. Uh, we've reviewed the evidence, we've, we've engaged with the sector, spoken to practitioners, to commissioners, to experts. We've used that to inform the development of an economic model in Excel, and we're now sharing those findings back with the sector and trying to understand how we can use this research to develop policy and practice and research in the future. The project team has been uh, myself. I'm, I'm an economist. My day job is that I'm a health economist. But I've been seconded to why me. Uh, Lucy Harris has done some great work. She's been working as a researcher on this, particularly focused on the literature review. And then Lucy Jaffe, who's the managing director of why me, who you've just heard from, who's been having sort of strategic oversight of this work. So far, we've reviewed the existing evidence. We've engaged with the sector. We've recruited an advisory board who've had oversight of the research um, and you're going to be hearing from them later. That's going to be our panel in the second half of this session. Uh, we've gathered data from local areas. We've developed a model. We've submitted abstracts, one to a conference and one to a journal. Um, and then we're going to be publishing towards the end of the year, seeking academic publication early next year, and then trying to really understand how this research can inform um, the advocacy work of, of why me and decision making in, in local areas going forward. So a quick, a quick word on the existing research. Um, so uh, Lucy's been looking at the evidence in a number of themes. So looking at existing economic evaluations, looking at meta-analyses of RJ, uh, looking at the benefits, so the benefits of victims, the, the benefits in terms of reoffending, and then looking at studies that include estimates for the costs and resource use associated with delivering RJ. There are some existing economic evaluations of RJ, but they tend to be trial-based, which means they're looking at RJ delivered in a specific place at a specific time to a specific group of people in a specific way. There is one economic model for RJ, which is contained, um, which I'll talk about later, um, but it's, it's only for youth offending and it has a number of limitations in terms of the methodology. So just giving a quick overview of some of the existing research. So um, we've, we've got a, a selection of papers here. So we've got the four Shaplin reports. So uh, Joanna Shaplin, who you be, uh, Professor Joanna Shaplin, who you'll be hearing from later, um, conducted this really kind of defining research for the sector um, looking at a range of studies of the use of RJ across the country. Um, and the, the fourth Chaplin report includes an economic evaluation, a trial based economic evaluation of, of RJ associated with those studies. Then there's also um, the Sherman and Strang research. Which is looking at restorative justice conferencing in England, but also abroad uh, in Australia and in the US. Now that's partially overlapping with Chaplin because the um, the restorative justice conferencing studies in Shapland are the same ones that are included in uh, Sherman and Strang. So those are two partially over overlapping programs of research, um, and then they both inform the research that we've conducted. The matrix evidence report is the economic model I was referring to a minute ago, which is focusing on youth justice and different interventions that can um, be transformative within youth justice, of which RJ is one of them. Finally, we've got the economic and social costs of crime. So this is a Home Office report from 2018, which is looking at the economic impacts of crime um, holistically. So looking at the financial impacts on the state, but also looking at uh, the impact on, on businesses and on, on individuals, both financially and in terms of their well-being. And that's, again, a, a really key um, piece of evidence for, for building up the research that we've conducted. OK. So um, a brief overview of the scope of this research. So we're looking at adult offending and youth offending. We're looking at um, all, all range of victims. We're looking at crimes with an identified offender. We're looking at restorative justice interventions delivered post sentence. And we're looking at these interventions as a supplement to conventional justice. So we're looking at uh, the conventional justice process without RJ versus the conventional justice process with the addition of RJ. And we're looking at those impacts in terms of uh, a cost social benefit ratio. So what, what are the benefits that you accrue per pound invested in RJ? We're looking at the total economic impact and we're looking at the impact on reoffending specifically. We're focusing on England and Wales. Uh, we've used 2021 costs and uh, in the base case, we've looked at a two year time horizon with longer time horizons and sensitivity analysis. Now for the non economists on the call, um, the base case is the main estimate from our research, and that's from what we believe to be the fairest or most realistic set of assumptions and, and data. We then conduct a sensitivity analysis, which is where we vary some of those assumptions and data to see how robust our findings are. So if I'm talking about the base case, that's the main estimate. And if I'm talking about sensitivity analysis, 
that's where we're testing out different assumptions. Um, so, so just just to come back to a few of those points. Uh, so there's a range of different points in the conventional justice pathway where RJ can be used. And to uh, massively simplify, you can think of RJ being used um, outside of the sort of courts system. And that's where it's more likely to be thought of as a sort of alternative to conventional justice. But for um, Frank. crimes where, uh, Frank. okay, sorry. Could you, can you make the slide any bigger? Um, the, um, maybe smaller, um, slightly smaller. Little, that's not, mm, okay. Yeah, is it, is it a little bit grainy on yours? It's hard to see the right hand column. Oh, I'll, I'll have to just uh, mm. verbally describe it, I guess. Um, mm. So uh, for the cases for in where RJ is being used post sentence, RJ is being used as a supplement to conventional justice. So the, the two things are being combined. And that's what we've been focusing on in this in this research. Um, at the lower level, where RJ is being thought of as a, as a, um, a potential substitute for conventional justice, the economic case is more about which of those processes is cheaper. Is it cheaper to do RJ? Is it cheaper to do conventional justice and prosecution. Um, whereas for, for this case, because we're looking at it as a supplement, it's more about the outcomes. It's more about do the outcomes later on justify this, this investment in RJ? Hi. Hi, I'm having some technical difficulties. Uh, give me two seconds. Mm Could, is that better? Can everyone see that now? Yeah. OK, perfect. And also just just pace yourself because I think some of the information is very dense. Oh, it's just okay. gone again. Um, would it so help if we put this. would we put the PowerPoint up? Yeah, if you like. Could you could we do that? Lucy and Kiva. Yeah, I can do that. Just give me two seconds. Great. So maybe, Frank, if Lucy's doing that, could you just sort of go back over that last point again about the the two different ways in which restorative justice can be used? Uh, you know, we're looking the two different types of uh, scenario in which we're looking at restorative justice. Uh, yeah, sure. Um... So yeah, so as I, as I was saying before, sorry, I don't, I don't know what's happened with my PowerPoint here. Um, but yeah, as I was saying before, there's there's different. Um, uh, either we can be looking at cases that are uh, going through the conventional justice system for more serious offences, in which case RJ is being used as a supplement to conventional justice, or um, for less serious offences, RJ might be delivered by the police. Um, and that can be, um, there are trials where it's looking at more as a kind of alternative to conventional justice and the economic benefits and considerations there are different depending on the different contexts. Um, um, yeah, Lucy H, do you have those slides? Very nearly, sorry, just bear with me. Can everyone see that? Yeah, that's great. Perfect. Oh, well, fantastic. Um, yeah, so can we move through to the current slide? 
Yeah. Sorry, let me just try. Apologies about this, everyone. Bear, bear with us. Um, we've got the slides. We've got the people. Uh, so just getting back on track here. Here we go. Excellent. Oh, excellent. Thank you, Lucy. Um, and so, OK, <laughs> sorry about that, everyone. Back in the room. So. Um, one of the interesting things that came up during our research was uh, various opinions about what constitutes RJ. Uh, in particular, what, what is an RJ conference? Um, so some of the research is looking specifically at RJ conferences, um, but, but people were sort of discussing, you know, does that relate to who attends the conference? Is that about the script that's used and the contents of the discussion? Is it about who's delivering the intervention? Uh, and we've sort of sidestepped that and tried to simplify by looking at direct RJ and indirect RJ. So direct RJ being any RJ intervention where there's direct contact between the parties and indirect RJ being um, indirect two-way dialogue between the parties, whether that be uh, shuttling by, by a practitioner or exchange of letters. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so uh, as I was saying about um, before we're looking at RJ as a supplement to conventional justice, and we've made some very simplifying assumptions about time. So we've assumed that the RJ is being delivered within one year, and then the benefits are being observed in in the, in the following years. Um, and and individuals can either go down either of these two routes. Um, they'll still be interacting with the conventional justice system, but they'll have this additional intervention as well. Um, and this, this is just a summary of some of the, the outcomes that we're looking at. So there's three outcomes that, uh, or buckets of outcomes that we considered. One is potential uh, direct benefits to the victim as a result of taking part. The second is the impact on reoffending and the subsequent impact on society as a result of that. And the third is the impact of the offender. Now, we, we weren't able to find um, the right kind of evidence in the right format to look at direct impacts on offenders. We have some data on direct impacts of victims, so we've included an exploratory scenario, and we have um, information from Strang 2013 that I was talking about earlier, looking at the impact of RJ on reoffending, and then we have the economic and social costs of crime, which we've used to look at the impact of changing reoffending on society. Okay, so proven crime is the tip of the iceberg, because you also have unproven crime and crime that's never reported. And so in order to get an overall view of the impact of um, interventions to reduce crime, you have to look at not just proven crime, but all crime. And our approach to that has been to look at the relationship between proven crime and total crime and apply that to reoffending and make assumptions about the relationship between proven reoffending and total reoffending. And we've done that using a method um, developed by Pro Bono Economics, and you're going to be hearing from their chief economist later today. Um, but there is a lot of uncertainty there about that relationship. Um, so using that relationship and using government data, we've estimated a baseline reoffending rate of 27 offences. So what that means is that on average, per offender in this cohort, they're committing, or there, there are 27 offences committed in the, their first year following sentence. Now, only some of those will be caught. So only some of a minority of those will be proven. But that, and, and also it won't be, um, it'll be very uneven. So for, for some reoffenders, they won't be reoffending at all. Whereas for others, the numbers will be far larger. Um, but, but that's an average. We then take the estimate from Strang 2013 about the levels of reduction in reoffending. And we apply that to that estimate. And that's what takes us from the numbers in the left column of the table to numbers in the right column of the table. So those are estimates of if you take individuals with these baseline reoffending rates, what would be their offending 
uh, rate on average if they participated in RJ intervention. Now, in the base case, um, we've only looked at direct RJ impacting reoffending because the established evidence relates specifically to RJ, uh, direct RJ. We've then included a sensitivity analysis where we assumed that indirect RJ is related, um, ha has some fraction of the effectiveness of direct RJ. That's the best way to put it. So in, in the base case, it's only direct RJ that's impacting reoffending. And in a scenario analysis, indirect RJ is also impacting reoffending, but to a lesser extent. Um, OK, an another important consideration is attrition. So not all cases that get referred into an RJ service will progress to participating in an RJ intervention. A number of things need to happen, as the practitioners on the call will know, in terms of um, risk assessments, the logistics of arranging a meeting, getting consent from both parties, and a number of um, cases drop out along the way. Estimates varied hugely across the services that we spoke to, but it was generally felt that attrition is pretty high. Um, a, a quite a lot of cases are, are kind of lost to follow up during this process. Some variation as well in terms of um, youth offending practitioners suggested to us that attrition rates in their services are lower, potentially as a result of the fact that there are fewer different organisations involved. So the people delivering the RJ have better access to data and it's easier to get consent. Um, but it does seem like uh, across the board, attrition rates are, are pretty high. Um, so in terms of the impacts of reoffending, we take this from the Home Office Economic and Social Costs of Crime. That's looking at anticipation, consequence, response, uh, and it's looking at a range of different stakeholders. So financial impact uh, on, on the government, but also um, it, it includes impact on businesses, impact on individuals. Um, OK, so there are there's lots of evidence to suggest that RRJ has direct benefits to victims. However, Generally speaking, it's not in a format that can be incorporated in an economic analysis, or at least it's very challenging to do so. One thing that we can use is that because we have from the Home Office Economic and Social Costs of Crime report, an estimate of the total average impact of crimes on victim well-being, we can use this as an upper bound because we can suggest that for most cases, RJ will only manage to partially, partially mitigate the harm of the crime. It won't, for most cases, manage to make the individual better off than they would have been had the crime never had happened. Now, there, there will be exceptions for sure, but I think at least it's a kind of a, a pragmatic approach to getting a sort of rough estimate. Um, and these estimates here in the table, there's going to be a huge amount of variation. So for each of those types of crime, there's going to be some victims where, where it's much hard, larger harm, some victims where there's a lower level of harm. But again, it's, it's a kind of very rough average for us to move in the direction of being able to evaluate uh, victim harm in this way. Um, and the, the way that they've estimated these is they've used the £30,000 per year of full health threshold that NICE uses to fund drugs. And they've used that um, to try and estimate the economic uh, impact of these harms. Now, criminals are specialists, so there's a, a strong relationship between the crime that they commit and the reoffences that they're likely to commit. And for the purposes of this research, there's two very important groups there. So one group is um, lower level but high volume offending. So ind individuals who are committing theft offences, their reoffending rates are very, very high and they're serving short sentences. And so they have lots and lots of victims. Um, but each of those victims potentially has a, a lower level of harm. Whereas there are some other crimes where you've got um, very serious offences, very long sentences, potentially lower reoffending rates. But that's those small number of victims or even single victim are experiencing a massive amount of harm. And so the economic case for RJ is different for those two groups. For the groups where there's very high rates of reoffending, but lower levels of harm, uh, RJ, the economic case for RJ is all about reducing reoffending. Whereas for the other group where there's 
fewer victims, lower rates of reoffending, but very high levels of harm. The economic case is much more about mitigating harm. Um, and for future economic analyses, I think it would make sense to handle these two groups separately. Unfortunately, we didn't have the data available um, in the right format to look at the direct impacts of RJ on offenders. Um, but actually, when you think about it, in a way, they're potentially the people who are affected most here. Because, you know, who has the most to lose from reoffending? Potentially, it's the offenders themselves in terms of the trauma of going to prison, not being able to see their families, losing their jobs, etc. And within the economic and social costs of crime, that's the one thing that doesn't feature is actually the impact on re of reoffending on offenders themselves. And we think that that's a really important area for future research. Um, we spoke to a range of different RJ providers, uh, independent local youth, um, about the resource use needed throughout the restorative justice pathway from referral through to intervention. And there are a real range of estimates in terms of the amount of time taken. And it also seemed that across cases, the amount of time taken varies massively, with some cases taking a very, very long time, um, lots of logistical work, lots of risk assessment going on before an intervention. Uh, we've come out at a sort of um, what we think is a, as a kind of rough average there of, of the amount of time taken to, to perform that work. Another aspect that's challenging is that there's a lot of fixed costs associated with running an RJ service when it comes to promoting RJ, training um, police in the local area, things like that, which don't relate to individual cases. Um, and again, trying to incorporate that is challenging, but we've included a sensitivity analysis to try and incorporate that. OK, so overall, the base case estimate um, from our analysis is £14 of social benefit for every pound invested or a total economic impact of £14 per pound invested. And this is as a result of the average amount of reoffending falling from 27 offences to 19 offences um, within this analysis. And you can see there that we've got estimates for the cost per referred case, of which many will never make it to an intervention, the cost per intervention, the benefit per referral, the benefit per intervention, and then that ratio of the total benefit and the total and the total cost. Now, around a third of that benefit relates to financial benefits to government. So that's you know lower reoffending means fewer victims seeking therapy, fewer offenders in prison, fewer offenders and victims going through the court process, and all of that has costs. And that's a third of the benefits here. The other two thirds relates to society in terms of avoiding the well-being impacts as a result of reoffending. And, and as it says at the bottom there, if you only look at the financial impacts, the financial impacts to government, you still get a positive return there in terms of four pounds of financial benefit to government for every pound invested. Um, and then, then we looked at a typical cohort of 100 cases. And so you can see there that you'd have a mixture of different offences being referred in. Um, of the 100 cases, you'd have 10 direct RJ interventions taking place. Um, 74 offences would be avoided. And you have a, a large social net benefit as a result of this investment. Looking at the population level is incredibly tricky because we just don't have enough data out there about what the current use of RJ is for this cohort. And it's very difficult to get that national picture. But just as a kind of exploratory analysis to get a sense of scale, we've looked at hypothetically what would be the impact of increasing access to RJ, by which I mean being referred rather than necessarily um, progressing to an intervention. What would be the, the impact of um, going from 5% of relevant cases being referred to an RJ service to 15%? And what would be the required investment? And what would be the impact um, in terms of the economic impact on society? So this is what I was talking about earlier with the sensitivity analysis. Um, so we can look at 
different varying different assumptions ver using different types of data and seeing what impact does that have on the results and what we can see is that some really important factors to consider are the cost of the rj pathway so if we vary the cost of delivering rj in our model this has a big implication for the um, cost benefit ratio of investing in rj so increasing our understanding and our confidence in being able to estimate the cost of rj would make us much more confident in understanding the cost benefit of RJ. Likewise, for the relationship between proven reoffending and total reoffending. So, if we were more confident about that relationship, then we'd be more confident about um, the benefits of investing in RJ. Now, interestingly, in this model, including direct benefits for victims did not have such a large impact. And I think the reason for that is that when thinking about those. Um, Rate types of reoffending where there's low impact on the individual victims, but lots of victims. Mitigating the harm to one of those victims is not going to be so important compared to preventing there being 10, 20, 30 victims in the future. And so when looking at that group, preventing reoffending becomes a much more consider important consideration than uh, mitigating the harm to individual victims. However, I think there are a number of limitations with the method that we've used there. So one is that for, for many victims and offenders, there will be multiple crimes being committed over the length of a relationship. So in the context of, of an abusive relationship, or maybe there's been a conflict in a, a neighbourhood, there will be multiple criminal events that are all being addressed within one restorative justice intervention. And so it may be skewed by just looking at one of those events. I think also at the moment, um, accessing RJ is a long process and a minority of victims choose to pursue that process. And so it's probably likely that the ones who stick it out are the ones for whom the crime has had a really important effect on them. And so averaging out across all victims is probably not a very good approach here because we're probably thinking about um, the group who access RJ are probably skewed towards the ones who had a a larger well-being impact as a result of the crime. And so I think that's all the more reason why um, the information that we have to look at direct impacts of RJ on victims at the moment has its limits, and it would be great to try and improve on that in the future. Um, another key area of uncertainty is how long the benefits persist for. So. Um, the, the main studies of RJ are looking at a sort of one or two year time horizon, but there's a lot of uncertainty about what happens after that and does reoffending continue to fall in subsequent years. Certainly there's a lot of case studies and anecdotal evidence to suggest that's the case, um, but more data on that to demonstrate that would increase the economic case for investment in RJ. Okay. So the first um, key finding from this relates to the economics. So this is another piece of, piece of research that suggests that there's a strong return on investment from investing in restorative justice. And this really aligns with YME's um, kind of key campaigns around lobbying the Ministry of Justice to have a national RJ action plan to increase access to RJ for victims and offenders. It also aligns with the um, kind of request, I guess, that uh, access to RJ be enshrined within the Victims Bill to ensure that all victims have access to RJ. Um, and the findings of this research align with, with previous research on this as well. Um, there are important gaps in the evidence. So I've, I've signposted a few of those during this presentation in terms of um, kind of, we need better bottom up costing. We need better measures of uh, well-being for victims and offenders um, and better national data collection because at the moment the national data there's too many gaps there's too much variation in the way people are recording it and as a result it's um, not not good enough quality to in, use within an economic evaluation um, now a couple of uh, observations from the conversations that we've had through this research so one is that the strongest evidence is narrow but perspectives on rj are very broad what I mean by that is the strongest, most rigorous um, evidence for the benefits of RJ are looking at direct RJ interventions delivered by trained practitioners 
in a particular way with particular offences. Um, but speaking to practitioners, there's a huge amount of variation in the sector in terms of who's accessing RJ, who's delivering RJ, and what the intervention actually is that's being that people are participating in. Um, and it, I think there should be a coming together there where the research is extended to look at some of this variation, but also potentially there's a sort of return, uh, a kind of renewed focus, I guess, on the evidence um, and, and those two things coming together in the middle. I think an example of that is um, restorative conversations. So whilst a lot of the research is looking at restorative justice and dialogue between harmed and harmer or victim and offender, I think a lot of the work within the sector is around interactions between professionals and victims and offenders and the nature of those interactions and the training that those individuals have. And a lot of practitioners would say that um, the build up to the intervention can have as much impact as the intervention itself. And I think that that's another area where it would be great to kind of bring together research and practice and try and te test that out a bit more. Um, but certainly in this analysis, a lot of the economic benefits are associated with reoffending. Now, in cases where the offender just doesn't engage and, and all that takes place is interaction between victim and professional, those benefits aren't really on the table. Um, so I think that's that's definitely something that needs to be kind of considered there. Um, and then, yeah, fi finally, there's a challenge for research in terms of a, a lot of key terms like referral, indirect RJ, conference. There's very different ideas out there about what those terms mean. And so it'd be great if we could have um, a bit a bit of kind of coming together and shared terminology, particularly for the national data collection, because I think part of the reason that the current MOJ data is such poor quality is that everyone's recording different things in different ways. And then just to kind of zero in on um, victim benefits. So there's there's a huge amount of research and local data collection on the benefits of restorative justice for victims. But there's a sort of scale of usefulness when it comes to research and analysis. And I think at one end is, is the kind of binary measures. So was this service helpful, yes or no? Which th there's not a huge amount that you can do with that as a researcher. On the um, far other end, when you start being able to um, combine this information into single measures of victim well-being, then that enables much better evidence-based decision making and research. Uh, and so moving through from kind of, you know, binary, was it helpful, yes or no, then sort of very satisfied, quite satisfied, not very satisfied, the sort of ordinal measures. Then if you're getting people to do rankings, so like 0 to 10, that starts to become a, a, a little more useful. Um, but then the challenge is, if every service is using different measures and they're measuring in different domains, so they're looking at fear and sleep and anxiety and vengefulness, um, it becomes very hard to look at those all those things together at the same time unless you have a way of combining that information. Um, and I think we're, we're not there yet, but I think definitely moving towards combined measures of well-being that are used across a variety of services. So using the same measures across RJ as is being used in domestic abuse services, as is being used in the conventional justice system, then you could get a much better benchmark across these different processes about the impacts that they're having on the people that are participating in them. And so the key takeaways from this research are um, the results should be used with caution because there's a lot of uncertainty and there are a lot of gaps in the evidence. But nevertheless, this is um, strong evidence to back up the claim that there's substantial um, benefits from investing in restorative justice and a substantial return on investment. That is being achieved via lower reoffending as a result of individuals participating in RJ. Um, and, but a key area for future research is strengthening our understanding of the benefits of RJ and, and trying to combine different measures of victim and offender well-being um, into, into single measures of well-being that are sort of um, cohesive and that can be applied across different services. Thank you, Frank. That was absolutely brilliant, early, fascinating, even though I've heard it before, was gripped. Um, we have got a couple of questions. I'm just going to 
give them to you, see if we can uh, fit them in before the break. So Simon Wallace uh, from Norfolk and Suffolk, I believe, does uh, does this mean that uh, research mean that there are potentially additional benefits um, savings associated with RJ as part of an out of court disposal that aren't captured by this research? Uh, so for this research, we were looking at post sentence and so out of court disposal was out of scope, essentially. Um, but there is other research on the benefits of RJ for out of court disposals, which I'm happy to send you. OK, great. Um, and if a quarter and then Finula asks from Transform Justice, if a quarter of the social benefit return goes back to government, could you say a bit more about where the rest is going? Yes, sure. Um, so the rest is the benefit of preventing victims in the future. So the estimates that I showed earlier, which were estimates of the total well-being impact as a result of crimes, if you reduce reoffending, then you prevent future um, victims or people from becoming victims in the future. Um, and so that's where those other benefits are coming from. Great, thank you very much indeed. So um, we're going to take a break now. Um, thank you all. Uh, to keep Just turn your cameras and uh, mics off. Um, we'll be back at three o'clock, but uh, but not before we've shared a whiteboard with you where we would like you to um, uh, contribute some of your um, ideas. So that's coming up now um, and we will be back at three o'clock. So what, um, Lucy, could you just explain what people need to do? Oh. Yes, so there are a couple of questions on the whiteboard. Um, and you can add some text under each of the columns to answer the questions um, to do that. So it's currently on the share mode at the moment. So there's text uh, on the left hand side. You click it and then you click just like I'm doing, click like that. And then you can type in there. Um, you can also add notes on the side as well. Um, yeah, so we're looking forward to seeing your answers to these. OK, thank you very much. So we'll be back at three o'clock um, uh, promptly. See you later.
Hello, welcome back everyone. Hope you've got a cup of tea. Um, we're having some problems with the whiteboard, so do put your comments in the chat. Oh, it's looking quite funky. It's some somebody's written in a kind of angular fashion. Um, but thank you for that. Don't don't hesitate to put your comments in the chat. Um, we we really would love to hear from you. Um, yeah. I think one of the most important things that I'm thinking about at the moment as a um, director of YME is how you know how we can collaborate as a, across the restorative sector, both nationally and internationally, to come up with some of these really important um, answers to these really important questions that are often asked of us by people who are commissioning RJ or positions of authority uh, and power who can make the difference. I'm seeing some of that come across my screen. I'm now going to ask the panel, um, maybe we could take the whiteboard down. Hello. So. Welcome back to the Why Me space about economic evaluation of restorative justice. Um, I'm really delighted to welcome our panel today. Um, we've got uh, Joanna Shapland from the University of Sheffield. Joanna, do you want to give us a wave? Hey, got John Franklin from Pro Bono Economics. Yes, hello. And uh, Lisa Allen from Hampshire uh, Police and Crime Commissioner's hello. Office. Hello, Lisa. And of course, we've We've got Frank, our uh, expert, who's been working on this. Um, and we've had some some questions uh, thrown at us, but I'm just going to take the opportunity to ask you a question myself and introduce you. So um, first of all, the first question is going to be, what are your reflections on this research? So very broad question. I'm going to come to Joanna first, um, and then John, and then Lisa. And I'm just going to find your uh, that's right, here we go, biography. So Joanna, Professor Joanna Shapland, often associated with restorative justice, uh, seminal restorative justice research, criminologist, forensic psychologist and academic, specialising in restorative justice and victimology. Uh, she's the Edward Bramley, Bramley Professor of Criminal Justice at the University of Sheffield. And we've drawn significantly on your research, Joanna, uh, which was funded by the Home Office in 2002, 2008. Have I got those dates right? This national evaluation of restorative justice um, in England and Wales has shaped government policy. This research by Joanna has, has shaped uh, government policy on restorative justice in England, Wales and Scotland. So Joanna, I turn to you and say, what are your reflections on this research? Um, so over to you. Thank you. Well, my first reflection is that the results are actually not out of line with the previous work in the field. And that's good because one really wants a body of work that is coherent and that we can have confidence in, in terms of do you actually get an economic benefit uh, in relation to doing restorative justice? I mean, our research, which as you said, uh, reported in 2007-8 did find financial benefits and that was actually one of the key reasons why the government and it was the Ministry of Justice decided to support restorative justice at around that time and developed its first action plan. Unfortunately the impetus if you like has sort of plateaued um, and that's why we're needing this. And why this research particularly is really important is exactly as Frank has said, this is national modelling. What we did was a particular cohort going through the system at that particular time. And also the work that Frank has done is able to draw on much, much better estimates of the cost of crime to future victims uh, and the cost to the whole system of there being future victims and the need to prevent crime. Um, it surely, uh, this research clearly shows to my mind that investment in RJ and offering restorative justice to victims and making sure they hear about it, which is part of the problem at the moment, mm. 
actually then does produce financial benefits. And I would say that Frank's estimates, if anything, are probably a conservative estimates. That's the right way to do it. I totally agree. <laughs> um, but it means that if anything, if we could solve all the methodological problems he was outlining, we will probably actually get higher benefits rather than lower benefits out of that. And it's not, of course, just financial benefits that restorative justice can bring, because if you use different methods, you can look at victim well-being much more in the round, and you can start looking at the effects on offenders as they desist because of the effect of restorative justice meeting uh, on their thoughts about whether they should be leading their lives in that way or actually trying to do what they really want to do which is to stop offending so much and stop worrying about the police knock on the door and so yeah. forth. okay i'm just going to ask you to say your last yeah. point yeah 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 of course the problem with all of this though is that it's one government department which is probably going to need to fund restorative justice and it's other, excuse me, other government departments which are primarily going to benefit. So it's justice uh, and possibly the Home Office that needs to fund. And it's largely health and social services that gain from the being less offending in the future. Now we know that if you really do tell victims about restorative justice, about 25% of them say they're interested to take it up. Mm. The problem is they don't hear uh, there isn't the investment so that they can be followed up. But the one caution I would put in, which Frank has said, is that we really don't know about the effects of indirect restorative justice mm. or circles or other forms. Almost all the relatively good information is on direct meetings and particularly on conferencing stop Great. thank you very succinct thank you so much um and now i'm going to come to john john the same question to you but um you know just some reflections on on the research which's been presented today thank you very much uh, i mean first of all congratulate frank and the team for pulling it together it's it's no mean feat uh managing to pull that kind of story together and make that case um, I think my main reflection, I guess, is that Frank's had to do that in a situation of pretty imperfect information. And, and it's some imperfect information about some pretty basic stuff like how much does RJ cost, um, where there's a range of estimates and there's a range of different components, some of them fixed cost versus variable. So getting a really clear idea of what this would look like if it was rolled out has been surprisingly difficult, I think. Um, and we've seen that some of the assumptions around that are particularly important. Um, now, this isn't uncommon for a lot of social interventions and uh, pro bono economics. We work on a, a range of different things um, that, that affect society in different ways and deal with difficult issues. And it's pretty common to have imperfect information. What I think is more uncommon is the uh, approach that Frank has taken to being pretty clear and open and transparent about this. And I been, think it's been a very kind of mature approach to dealing with that. Um, and I like the way that he's approached the uncertainties around this. And for me, as a, as a geeky economist, the bit that I like most is the sensitivity analysis section where it's not necessarily the big headline grabbing stuff but it shows that even if you use quite a broad and different range of assumptions that go into this and you do always have a lot of assumptions that go into this kind of economic, economic analysis but even across quite a wide range of assumptions you're still getting a consistent picture that actually the benefits of this uh, are very very likely to outweigh the costs and outweigh them by quite a lot and that is the kind of consistent story that I take away from this, rather than necessarily any particular specific numbers, is that kind of overall picture of the uncertainty analysis and the reflection on those different assumptions that you can put into it. So I think, you know, broadly speaking, it's that key thing that across quite a wide range of different assumptions, it's looking like it's going to be pretty good value for money. Thank you very much, John. Um really good to have pro bono economics uh, on the, you know involved in the project as well um so lisa um you, you know you've you've worked for a long time in uh, delivering services to victims and, and in restorative justice and what's your reflection on this research 
Thanks, Lucy. Um, I'm sorry, yeah. I didn't introduce you properly. But I haven't introduced either John or Frank, uh, John or Lisa properly, but Lisa's Commissioning and Contracts Manager at the Office of the Police and Crime Commissioner for Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. Um, yeah, and is there, you're very successful in Hampshire in getting restorative justice to victims of crime. Would you like to? Thanks, Lucy. Um, yeah, I mean, as as Frank knows, I, I think I was a little anxious about my involvement in this because um, the, the, just the very term economics is quite scary to me. I um, don't understand it. Um, and uh, very much come at come at this, as Lucy said, from from my background as a practitioner first and foremost, um, several years ago, and now as a commissioner, um, where RJ is one of my areas of responsibility. And I think I, I put my practitioner hat on a lot for this. Um, you know, piece of work in in terms of thinking about all the challenges I've had to overcome in the in the past as a practitioner or as a, a manager of a commission service, where you've got to to kind of almost justify your existence a lot of the time, and 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 where the the outputs and and the outcomes might might not appear as as impressive as perhaps some of the other victim services that are funded in terms of the numbers coming through, and um and and. And now I, with my commissioner hat on when I'm going to our PCC and asking her to make a, a significant contribution to, um, you know, restorative justice services locally, but where the numbers perhaps don't don't tell the story of of, of the benefits um, that that can be a challenge. And I think that's why I was so keen to be involved, because I think, you know, I had that benefit of being a practitioner where I um, I know the benefits. I've seen them firsthand, um, uh, you know, and I've, I've, I've met people that it's been absolutely life changing for from, from that victim perspective, but also, um, you know, from that that offender perspective as well in terms of reducing reoffending. So um, I, I think, you know, as, as other colleagues have said, I think this this piece of research is is really important, Frank, in terms of highlighting some of those real challenges that that we see in the field in in terms of that that national data collection, the standardisation of that, and how valuable that that would be to to further understanding this area. Um, but but what I really hope it does is is give kind of confidence to other commissioners and other PCC areas that that you in order for there to be that. Both that economic benefit, but but you know the the benefit in terms of the impact to victims and and to offenders um, that that investment is is really worthwhile um, because we we know that just because the numbers might not appear huge, actually the return on the investment and and the return in terms of the impact it has for people who have had perhaps complex trauma histories it is really really valuable. So thanks, Lucy. My thoughts from a practitioner perspective predominantly. So valuable, Lisa, so valuable. Your contribution has really made it. I mean, the combination of, you know, your your experience and, and Joanne's academic and research background and then John from um, Pro Bono Economics, who I didn't um, introduce properly, but um, is, is chief economist at the Pro Bono Economists, no less. Um, he's a, and Pro Bono um, combined project work with individual charities and social enterprises with policy research that can drive systemic change. So he's got 10 years of experience of working as a government economist and oversees the quality of the economic analysis at Pro Bono, uh, Pro Bono Economics, has brought a really kind of uh, combination of pragmatism and um, also um, a deep economic knowledge to this to this project. So thank you, John. Um, I'm just going to ask, I'm going to ask you to, to answer two questions or just two questions and I will invite Frank as well to comment. Um, I think one of the really interesting questions we've had in the chat, so I'm, no, I'm going to come back to that in a minute, but David Masters has asked, who is works for Probation Wales. David, would you like to ask your question, in fact? If you're there, David. Yeah, I can do, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so my question is, with what level of certainty can we say that RJ itself is causing the reduction in reoffending? rather than it being the type of person who consents to RJ in and of themselves being less likely to reoffend. Maybe I could respond to that one if that's okay, Lucy. Yes, that's great. Um, with probably with some help from Joanna because she conducted the research. But um the, the the thing that's really special about the evidence that informed this model, which comes from the Strang 2013 meta-analysis and from the Shaplin reports, is that they're randomized control trials. And the way that they randomized is they randomized the case is being referred in. So it's not about who consented and who didn't consent. 
It's about whether or not they were referred for a service. And I think that's the thing that really makes this evidence stand out from other evidence in relation to RJ is, is that robustness in terms of having randomization. Yeah, Joanna, would can, you like? yeah. Can I say um, the work that we did uh, when we had all the results, of course, the Ministry of Justice said, OK, so can we target this? Are there, is there a particular kind of person or a particular kind of offence that really is going to have serious reductions in reoffending and therefore major financial benefits and so forth? And we looked at all the data and the answer was no. This was a very unpopular answer to the ministry at that time. because of course they wanted to target it and have just a small investment. But what we found was that the only things that really distinguished um, those cases in which there was really significant reductions in reoffending were about how the people concerned, the offenders and the victims, actually reacted to the RJ process itself. And that meant it was not about the type of person or the type of offence or the type of offender or the number of previous convictions. It was about uh, how they both interacted with each other, the participants, and how it touched them, basically. And that's very similar to previous results in Australia and New Zealand. But it's about the process itself. So you can't just select people from stuff you know about them in the beginning. It's about how RJ affects the people going through it. And I think that probably helps in answering your question, but you must say. Thank you very much, Jana. Um, I'm going to just go, go to my next question. Um, and, it, you know, if we were are to use this, if we are if we were happy that this is, you know, we're happy with this research, which sounds like there's some kind of kind of metaphorical clapping going on around the room. This is great. We're in heading in the right direction. We need some more research uh, to underpin this. Um, but what do you think the key implications are for funding large scale commissioning of restorative justice? Um, do you, you know, could, could you just give me some reflections on, OK, if we take this as a basis for proceeding, and um, we had control of the Ministry of Justice uh, budget. What, what, what would be the implications um, of funding for, for large scale commissioning of restorative justice? I'm going to come um, to John first, if that's OK with you, John, and then um, I'll go around the room in the same order. They've come to John, then Lisa, then Joanna. I feel like there's there's a short answer and a slightly longer answer. So the, the short answer is it builds a pretty strong case for uh, increased funding for RJ in order to roll it out. Uh, and it builds a strong case from the perspective of overall savings to society, but also savings to government. I think my my longer answer um, is that it starts to build a case. Uh, and I think in rolling it out, it should be done in a way that helps us to fill those evidence gaps that, that Frank has had to work around in piecing this together. And I think it would be a real, real shame, actually, for it to be rolled out en masse without steps taken that gathers the right data that builds that kind of data infrastructure in a consistent way like frank was talking and thinks about how that rollout happens in a way that can start to fill those evidence gaps that we've got because i think if that happens then you miss a real opportunity to understand the true scale of it um, and also start to fill in some of those gaps on different types of rj or and the different language around mm -hmm. it and making sure that you can um you really know which which parts of RJ work, which types of RJ work, and potentially which ones are more effective than others. So I think I, I, I say it builds a strong case for rolling it out more widely. I would put that caveat around it, and you'd expect me to again, being the person I am from the organisation I'm from. Uh, but I think it's really important to do that in a way that builds the evidence and fills those evidence gaps that that have been really had a, a kind of light shone on them, I guess, by the, the work that Frank's done. Yeah. Um, someone's someone's on not on mute. Could yeah, you mute, please? Like is that David? All right, thank you. Um, I, I mean, one of the things that I I'm just reflecting on is is one of Joanna's points is uh, but is about if you're looking at the impact of restorative justice, how do we measure that across more than just the department which is funding it? You know, the activities that that the that the, the so if we're like measuring it all around justice, 
um, or policing, for example, ha ha the impacts could be on less doctor's visits or, you know, less use of um, uh, health services or not going to work or divorce or whatever the consequences might be for um, for, for that person who's either a, uh, who's affected by crime and conflict. The, I'm going to come to Lisa. Lisa, if you, you know, what do you think the key implications are for funding at large scale commissioning of RJ? And I, I wondered also if maybe right, right, reflect on the way in which we've the currently restorative justice is funded, it, you know, for different groups of people. So there's, you know, there's a pot of money for people who commit crime. There's a pot of money, well, there isn't a pot of money for people who commit crime, but, you know, the, there's a pot of money for people who suffer from the effects of crime. H how do you, would you like to reflect on that? You know, if you if you were to design large scale commissioning of RJ, what, what would you do? Um, so, yeah, building on some of what John said as well, I, I completely agree. I think we need to have that standardization of, of terms and what we define um, as what um, because I think at, at the moment we're, we're comparing different things across across the country and that's even with the same pot of funding um, so I think that that, that that in itself is is a challenge and, and needs to be addressed I think um, you know the the findings of the APPG inquiry and and John touched on it you know in terms of the national data collection and, and until we're, we've got that kind of standardization in terms of 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 what's being delivered and and, and things like that we're, we're, we're always going to be on the back foot with that um, but in terms of kind of you know large-scale commissioning um, and and different pots of funding I think what, what your hope is for something like this Lucy is that it will encourage government departments to be a bit more flexible um, in, in terms of, you know, in, in Hampshire, when we um, commissioned our service a few years ago, we we wanted to be able to offer the, the service to, to both victims and offenders who wanted to initiate restorative justice. Um, but but the, the funding devolved commissioners from the Ministry of Justice is specifically for victim initiated restorative justice. So, you know, we had to be creative and encourage our PCC to use additional funding from a different budget to enable that to take place. Um, and so hopefully, you know, there's, there's, there's future opportunities around collaboration with with other um, with other government um, funding streams and, and organisations. Um, and things like that so um yeah i think I, I as i said building on what john said it's it's about filling in some of those gaps and also about you know understanding the value across all of the different restorative processes available um because the, the focus has has understandably been um for this research on, on direct but um indirect um methods can be just as as beneficial um and and until we understand that we're, we're not really going to know the full impact yeah absolutely i mean the you know if you if the restorative justice case is going in a lot of work is done before some of them uh, end up in an encounter and you know i think that looking at the cost of that can sometimes be alarming for local commissioners whereas if we can show that you know even with the numbers going through to a meeting we've got a good cost benefit argument then that's an argument for doing it but if we can show the additional value in having those conversations but prove them not just go oh i feel it's this and you know every 10th victim is coming out you know going hooray i've had an amazing time you know qualitative we we will if when we can do that we will have an incredibly strong case for for better uh, you know for higher funding for this area um, so, Joanne, I'm coming to you now. You know, what do you think the key implications are for uh, funding a, a large scale uh, commissioning of restorative justice? Um, I think there are two separate things under the phrase large scale commissioning of restorative justice. One of them is ensuring that victims do actually know about restorative justice and putting funding and effort into that. And that's actually an international obligation on the government. And it's in one of John's early state, uh, slides, Victims Code of Practice and so on. All victims should have information about restorative justice. That's not happening. We know very well that's not happening from the Victims Commissioner's reports and so forth. But because restorative justice is voluntary, unless they hear, they can't know and decide they want it. So that's the one part. And I really do think we need to tackle that. 
Um, the second part is if they say, oh, right, that sounds interesting. Hadn't heard about that before. Um, then there has to be the service there to actually deliver the process of restorative justice. Absolutely. We don't know enough about all the different potential forms of restorative justice. And I totally agree with both John and Lisa on this. We do know that some things which are occasionally referred to as restorative practice, such as victim awareness courses, so-called, um, do not produce the levels of reoffending decrease that we were seeing in the research that we're discussing. So we really do need to distinguish between restorative justice, which is that offender, that victim being in communication, whether that be directly or indirectly. We need to distinguish between direct and indirect. We need to know a lot more about indirect, I think, before we can really go all out for uh, large scale commissioning of RG as a, J, as a general everything phenomenon. At the moment, what this research and other research says to me is yes, we should have large scale commissioning of direct restorative justice, direct meetings, conferencing, mediation. But we do need to know what we're going to say then to victims who say, oh, I really, really couldn't meet with my offender at the moment, but I would like something. Mm. So we've got to solve that conundrum. Mm. So there are several parts to this. And the first thing is, please tell people about it, because yeah. otherwise there's absolutely no way that they can decide to participate in it. Maybe that's a really good, I was going to ask Frank, because we had lots of discussions, didn't we, about what were the right focus for this research was. And one of the questions was exactly about this access to ref referral to or kind of take up the option of restorative justice. Do you, do you want to say something about that, Frank? And I mean, it was a kind of it was on the table as a choice to to research that, wasn't it? Uh in, in terms of what we're talking about with the kind of indirect RJ and some of the, the build up, um, is, is that what you're referring to, Lucy? Well, I'm just talking about if you, the tackling the issue of people, the cost of referral, the cost ah. of trying to understand, the cost of like trying to get people to access the service is possibly, is another really important question. That's right. We were talking about a piece of research that could look at interventions that are about increasing access. Because a lot of the work that YME does is about thinking about, um, I guess what you could call challenging cases or, you know, cases that fall into sort of particular groups who might face uh, particular barriers or discrimination in society and thinking about how you can smooth the process of accessing, accessing RJ for those groups. And so we were talking about and, and maybe, you know, that that's still something that could potentially be done in the future is a piece of research that looks at uh, different types of interventions that are about increasing access and compares those in terms of a cost benefit. You know, is it worthwhile investing them? Because there's, there's um, when, when we've spoken to practitioners and commissioners and managers, there's loads of barriers, whether that's kind of information sharing, um, the fact that offenders are offering different areas to where the RJ service is. And so they're constantly building new relationships with different prisons, different police forces. And so there just seems like there's a huge amount of friction and fragmentation within the RJ uh, ecosystem, I guess you could say. And <laughs> There, there was a lot of feedback from, um, I thought it was really interesting from the youth offending services saying that actually having all those things under one roof and having a little bit more consistency in terms of the individuals that need to collaborate in order for RJ to take place does seem to make a big difference. Um, and also there's a really interesting piece of um, one of the articles by Strang. She's got this bit about a suction, not a trickle. And I think what that meant was in order to get their research off the ground and get enough cases, they had to be really, really persistent in terms of putting triage workers in courtrooms, ringing round different workers, um, professionals working in the area, trying to get referrals. It wasn't enough to just set up the service and wait for the cases to come. They had to be incredibly proactive. And I think that that is another key thing here is it's not just about kind of um, what happens after the referral and the cost benefit after the referral. It's also about interventions that need to take place pre-referral in order to actually make sure that there's increasing access to RJ. Thank you, Frank. That's that's great. I'm going to now um, 
give throw open these questions to the panel. So it's fingers on the buzzers, uh, please. But um, the uh, could the so we've got a question from Alex. Alex, would you like to ask that yourself? Diamantopoulos, if we're still with us, Alex. Hi, I'm what? still here. Uh, can would, you hear me? Would you, yeah, great. Would you like to just say yeah, where so you're I'm from? Maybe um, probably uh, new to this. I'm a colleague of Frank and just joined to see the economic analysis. So probably I understand more of the economic modeling rather than the context. So I think you kind of answered the question before in your discussion, but I was wondering if we can have more context about the funding that is required. And so if if we have the results that it's not, it, it, the cost is minimal compared to the uh, return on the investment. So if I, if I then consider all the different interventions that are considered for the budget, why is this not a priority then? What does it need to happen to be a priority? Uh, more content like what, what other interventions are competing for this budget um, do you want to thank you oh, lisa's going to lisa you know in terms of what other services are competing for this budget um in in terms of the not speaking for the yachts because that's that's a different funding stream in terms of a restorative justice for victims of young people but in terms of the the funding that's devolved to commissioners it comes through the ministry of justice to the, the victim services grant and so from that we fund um you know sexual crime support services such as is is the services we fund domestic abuse support services multi-crime services so that there is a lot of of things competing for for the same thing um but but obviously a lot of those are when people are in times of of crisis um you know for for isva services or, or idvas or, or whatever it might be um whereas what what kind of our service has seen with having a really flexible scope um is that actually we we see some of those victims but victims maybe of of 10 years ago or or something when they are still dealing with the after effects of, of what happened to them and they're still living in that trauma and 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 the, the aftermath of that. And then they come forward because restorative justice is something that that they haven't tried and something that they feel can help meet all of those, you know, unmet needs in terms of those unanswered questions and and things like that. So so yeah, PCCs have got really difficult decisions to make in terms of where they they put their money. Um and you know, we're lucky in Hampshire that, that the PCCs we've had have been really supportive of it and have kind of largely gone with the the old ring fenced recommendation um, that, that the MOJ put out, you know, sort of six, seven years ago. But, but that ring fence has been removed now, as, as Joanna said, things have plateaued a little bit. Um, and so, you know, that that guidance isn't there any longer. And, and some people are, are, are having to make those difficult decisions. Thank you so much. Um... And I think the other th something I would add is that the um, so regional probation directors who have a restorative justice on their potential kind of interventions for rehabilitation uh, are also have other interventions such as um, anger management or I can't I can't list them. There are other people on this call who know them better. Um, so why aren't why aren't they choosing RJ? Well, we've mentioned some of the barriers already. Um, so part of it is access to data. Part of it is understanding the impact of it. And the other one, frankly, I think, is because you can't people don't understand what the economic value is, and they're comparing it against other interventions where there's more a better and more solid, a robust evidence uh, base. Um, so Frank. Yeah, I was just gonna. I, um, I think earlier Lisa made the really key point. What I think is the key point is that. All the commissioners we've spoken to, it seems like there's a tendency towards a kind of cost per case comparison. But because there's not clear enough information on the economic impact of RJ and the benefits of RJ in terms of victim outcomes, offender outcomes, there's a reversion back to looking across that really broad set of services that um, she was just listing and then thinking about, well, how much does it cost per person? And then RJ looks expensive per person. And because of that, there's a sort of pressure away from it. But I think that it is. It's a difficult comparison because they're very different services in the sense that RJ has two parties, it has the offender and it has the victim, whereas many of those other services are only working with one of those parties. And so if you're just looking at a cost per case, then you're really not getting a full picture there. And I think that's what 
my kind of highest ambition for this research would be the first step away from doing a cost per case comparison and the first step away towards having some kind of way of comparing those different types of services in a way that is more holistic and includes the benefits as well as the costs. Thank you very much. Um, um, oh, and we've got two more questions here. Oh, Jasvinda. Hi there. Um, yeah. Really Hello, good to today. have you here. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good to be. Good to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the the question I want to ask is is not particularly on just the subject that we're talking today, but I'm here in Leicester, and obviously some of the stuff that's been going on within communities in Leicester, as you probably heard, ain't been too uh, too clever. However, the agencies, uh, the multicultural agencies, city council, county council, police, multicultural uh, council of faiths, or the agents that you would expect to be at the top table to um, look at a restorative interventions. Um, just don't seem to be there in terms of community cohesion and the costs and where money comes from. And it's a very complicated picture, uh, which I think Frank has alluded to numerous times. Um, but I just I just think that um, apart from just the RJ that we're talking about, there are plenty of applications where this restorative intervention could take place. So, for example, the stuff that's been going on in Leicester has huge impact across a huge amount of communities. Uh, and also the voice that you don't hear is that of um the community uh women for a start and things like that you hear of a lot of men who are out beating each other up etc etc and all the rest of it i think there's massive benefits to be had about trying to pull in other sectors and other workers and the pathways that we could actually utilize and i think for example the um the appg uh, as its first recommendation just basically is to let join things up together more often i get fed up of joining things together all the time because it's very old and nearly as old as i am but i do think I do think that this somehow needs to be, uh, what, what, I don't know what the word is, embedded, thrust down the throat of somebody. But some of these things really do need to be grasped by the throat and actually kind of shaken to see the value of. We all know the value of RJ. Other people know the value of RJ. But when somebody says we need you to quantify it and put it in some kind of quantitative model, uh, when I know I've seen a, a rape victim who's actually kind of uh, really happy with the support that they've got, even though an outcome hasn't been measured and given back to the MOJ, and nobody sees that six months of work, two years of work uh, going on, which can't be costed. I think there's a huge area of work that we need to do in just in terms of advocacy and getting people on board. Uh, and the fact that um, the last uh, crime commissioner has just recently uh, uh, resigned, you know, is not a good picture in terms of knowing what the kind of scope of the environment actually is for victims. Mm. Not a question per se, a bit of a rant, but also I just no. want to widen the widen the actual kind of conversation. Yeah, well, thank you for your, um, well, as you put it, a rant. I mean, I think this, you know, shows that you're really engaged, you're doing restorative justice, you can see the application of it, and the passion and the experience you've got is what one of the things that we want to underpin through this work is this through really hard evidence about the economics. So that kind of accompanies that passion and that when, you know, we're talking to local authorities or police and crime commissioners or the government, they, it's really, it's a, we've got some solid figures there um to show um show how we can uh, bring you know economic make good spending decisions um and and advise government and and purse people who hold the purse in a way that will benefit us all um what, one of the things i mean the all party parliamentary group which has been mentioned several times has really been a really exciting um coming together of experts across the restorative justice sector not all experts i have to say but a few um organizations including um why me have come together to advise the all party parliamentary group on restorative justice which is chaired by elliot coburn there's a um inquiry report which was produced in 2021 which comes up with a set of recommendations many of which intersect with some of the the ones that we are proposing today such as a national action plan because it seems increasingly clear to me that um the, the the siloing of people, both victims and offenders, and the um, associated budgets with those, um, but also the in, the budgets associated with communities, health, housing, uh, are really it, it it requires a national action plan for us to see bring that together. It's also been very exciting, and I know Ben's on this call and looking at the evident, you know, so a sort of framework for evaluation of restorative justice um, and what success looks like. Um, 
but but really like looking at how can we come up with some a national framework um, for m measure, monitoring and evaluating restorative justice, even if it's not everything, a core set of data, ideally that will um, a chime, what's the word with it, you know, cover the government well-being, um, index of well-being, is that the right way of, this is in my, the, I'm in, looking in, at Frank. In the index of deprivation, you mean? No, uh, well-being, um, well uh, Frank, I'm looking at you. Yeah, Lucy's looking at me. So, uh, so um, I'd say there's two important uh, pieces of research that are progressing towards government measures of well-being. One is um, the the ONS have this question: How are you feeling about life nowadays? Um, and uh, they use they're using that across a range of services. And there's also something called the EQHWB, which is um, a progression from health services. Uh, to like um, the EQ5D, which is a measure just of health, to the EQHWB, which would be a measure of well-being. And so the idea is that not only will um, NICE and other health organisations be um, appraising drugs, but they'll be able to be able to appraise a broader set of um, interventions, um, including mental health interventions. Um, I'm just going to come round. Oh, Jonah, yes. I was just going to... Please say your piece, and then I'm going to come around with a final um, question to the panel. Um, so, Joanna. OK, just to say, um, where there have been difficulties within communities, um, in England and Wales, there hasn't been that much work uh, in relation to restorative justice, but there is a lot of good work that has been done in other countries. Um, so there's work in Scotland, in Edinburgh, there's work in Northern Ireland, based in Belfast, and there's been a lot of work in Hungary as well uh, in relation to uh, difficulties within communities or between communities and the use of restorative justice in those situations. And it is something that we really could pick up on uh, in this country as well. We've really taken the sort of individual case path if you like, the individual victim, the individual offender, much more than the within community and between communities work. That's all. Thank you, Joanna. Um, I'm just going to, Ben's ask us a question just before I come to you all. Do you have any plans to trial the model with PCCs and undertake further research about how it is used and their findings? Well, Ben, there's a multi-million dollar question because we are actually applying for money to do that. We've got a model uh, which we uh, people who are commissioning RJ very, uh, I believe, Frank, before I sort of overstep the mark, but it, it's actually a model into which you can put your figures um, and see how that, um, you know, model your own um, scenario, if you like, in your area. So do get in touch with us. Anyone who's interested in funding further research by me or in collaboration with others, please get in touch. Um, and also, if I might as well take the opportunity to say again, ask you, uh, there'll be an opportunity to donate to me so we can continue to do this work and um, take the the model and the findings further and really get best value out of the, this research. Um, so panel, I'm just going to ask you, I mean, you've got a choice of questions here. So there's, um, what do you think the implications are for future research? Um, but the second one is, what would you, um, what do you think the, the action is that, that people on this call might take? So what, what you know, do you, or, or a personal action that you're, you're going to take as a result of this? So um, what do you think the implications are for future research? Um, or what's one thing you think that you might do or you might sort of ask others on the call to do following what you've heard today? So I'm going to come to Lisa first. Thanks, Lisa. I'm, I mean, I think in terms of implications for future research, I think we've we've probably covered covered those. I think um, I think it's been picked up by by all of us, kind of the limitations around the um, not understanding the impact of indirect um, restorative processes and how beneficial that would be. Um, and uh, yeah, also some of the, you know, the other bits picked up on um, by, by colleagues previously. So uh, in terms of the second question, in terms of what, what I'm going to do, um, we're about to recommission our service in, in Hampshire. I'm pleased to say that we've we've already had a decision later signed off by our commissioner you know committing to some future investment and look forward to 
um, to that that going live. Um, and and I'm pleased to say that it you know it it continues kind of our commitment in Hampshire around a healthy investment in this area. And I hope that that it in, encourages other PCCs to do the same. And and I put out that offer to to any other PCC area who who wants to talk to us about what we've done in Hampshire to to get in touch. Fantastic. Thank you. Actually, just reminded me we've got an OPCC event at YME um, of a network of PCCs who are coming together at the end of October. So if you're interested in, in attending to share knowledge and experience, please, please do get in touch. Um, I'm going to come to Joanna uh, now. Do you want me to ask you the question again? Uh, no, um, I think I've said more than enough about what research we need. Uh, what this has done is to reaffirm my previous interests in can one do economic analysis in this very imprecise kind of set of circumstances and I think the answer is definitely one can and that the sensitivity analyses that Frank has been doing are really important in that and but I do think that we need to seriously encourage government to develop better well-being measures in general for the uh, the more um, psychological side and mental health side if you like uh, of effects because that's what's so important in relation to crime and victims and antisocial behavior as well uh, compared to the previous health economics uh, concentration if you like on physical health and operations yeah. and are you going to be dead in five years and all that sort of stuff where all this started so if there's anything I can do uh, to help in this um, I would be delighted so to do I think we've got your phone number so you know will be <laughs> a fantastic offer um, and John um, I'm coming to you and then finally Frank I mean, I think I'm going to repeat a bit of what's already been said, but in terms of the, the potential future research areas, I, I think that the well-being measures offer a fantastic route through to doing this. I think there is far more acceptance uh, amongst uh, civil servants, I will say, within government. Uh, I think the acceptance potentially amongst politicians is, is yet to be fully tested, uh, but certainly amongst civil servants um, and commissioners that that you can measure well-being. There are robust ways of doing this that have been well tested. And in fact, the Treasury released guidance last year on how you can put a monetary value on that as well. So you can incorporate them directly in the kind of economic analysis that Frank's done. So I think, and it doesn't have to be horrendously complicated. The, the ONS measures some of their advantages. They may not be as comprehensive and as perfect as, uh, you know, you get very detailed measures of well-being, but they work and they capture pretty much what matters. They respond in sensible ways to the kinds of factors that would affect people's lives. And there is lots of research out there about that now. So adopting the life satisfaction question that, that Frank mentioned earlier uh, as a key measure of an, an outcome on the, the, ultimately the kind of quality of life that um, people have uh, from things like restorative justice, I think is feasible. I think it's doable and it should be getting rolled out um, across as many government services as possible as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so I think that would be the key area for, for further research for me, would be uh, picking up on that. Um, in terms of what what we could potentially do, I think I keep getting told that 2023 is a key year in terms of getting into um, the manifesto commitments of the each of the, the leading parties. So I think for me, if I'm thinking about how how can you get restorative justice on the map and being pushed as a kind of political priority, uh, I think there's a, a 12 month window now uh, where if you don't get it into their manifestos, uh, it's going to be a lot harder over the next five years. So I think drawing on the back of research like stuff that Frank's done, uh, using the connections that people in the APPG have, uh, is there ways that you can get to talking to the right people to start to get it into, um, you know, at least one of the um, parties, major parties uh, manifesto commitments that would be a pretty big step forward. Uh, so that's what I'd be encouraging, I guess, why me and others on the call to be doing is thinking about how uh, those connections can be used to, to make that happen. 
That's fantastic. Thank you. I love the connection between, you know, research and then the actual change on the on the ground or in policy level and then on the ground. Um, I'm going to come to you, Frank, in a minute. I'm going to invite the audience um, to now, if you wish to share what you think you would do or you're going to do as a result of this call, please do in the chat. So, you know, if you think oh, I'm going to talk to my uh, my commissioner of RJ about it, or I'm going to ask for the models uh, or more information about that. Um, I'm going to write to my MP uh, or look up the APPG uh, RJ inquiry. Uh, you know, I'd be love to hear what you what you're going to commit to do, um, or if you indeed if you've uh, signed up to our newsletter or donated. So maybe Lucy, you could put those links in the chat. Um, so if you want, I'm going to come to that again in a minute. Um, so Frank, would you like to just sort of say a last few words? Um, yeah, I, I, so I, you know, I, I sort of agree with what everyone else has said really about um, improvements in the way that we measure well-being. There's been a huge amount of measurement of the benefits of RJ, but it's about measuring it in a way that can inform decision making can, and can inform research. And I think that the evolution of these um, simple but very widely used measures of well-being is, is very exciting for economists who are interested in um, social policy and, and services because it's going to really open up uh, new opportunities for us to do research and also new opportunities for evidence based decision making. Uh, and so I think that's that's a really kind of exciting direction for us to go in. In terms of what I'm going to do, uh, we're going to publish the the reports and also the model towards the end of this year, so people will be able to have a you know mess around with the model themselves, have a look through it, maybe make some changes, maybe use it in in their research or their decision making. Um, and yeah, just really keen to kind of um, for for to see how YME take this forward, really, and in, in terms of YME working with um, local commissioners and national government and and the sort of um, as I was saying before, I guess the, the coming together of the evidence and the practice and bringing those things together together in the middle, I think that's really key. Thank you so much. I mean, I, I'm very excited as well that we are an integral part of the All Party Parliamentary Group, and this will really add to that. So another really big chunk of the jigsaw together in terms of the the briefings and the and the report and recommendations that we've made. So I'm just going to um, wrap up now and say thank you so much. And one of the things I've really learned as a director of a small charity is that collaborating with um, professionals in other sectors such as um, health economy, so bringing Frank on board has really brought brought um, uh, rigor and an outside eye to the work that we do um, so though we are very passion led you know we um, we love what we do we can see that individual people really really benefit and, and there's can lots and lots of evidence that we work with very very dedicated professionals police uh, police and crime commissioners um, restorative justice people right across the country um, but this is really a missing piece um, it feels that, to me like this is makes a huge has the potential to take it to another level about uh, restorative justice investment uh, in the UK and perhaps internationally because we've had a lot of interest internationally as well and around the world. Um, so I'm going to just say thank you so much for coming along. Uh, all our advisory member board members have given their time for uh, freely. Um, so thank you very much, Joanna Shapland, Lisa Allen and John Franklin for being on our advisory board. Um, and above all, um, thank you so much, Frank, for uh, being part of our team, continuing to do that on a voluntary basis and taking this work forward. You've really made a difference uh, to not just why me, but also to restorative, the future of restorative justice. Uh, and then thank you, Lucy Harris um, and Kiva Baxter for backing, uh, uh, making this event happen. Um, so please do sign up to our newsletter, stay in touch, um, and we'll be, and that's the best way to find out about the when the report is going to be launched um, and when the model will be available for you to use. Uh, so yes, look forward to seeing you again soon in one one room or another, hopefully in person. Thank you. Thanks, Lucy. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you, John. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Really good to see you. Great contribution. Thank you. Can we? Are we going to manage to get all that chat? Oh, Jeanette's been fun. Very excited. That's great. Thank you all very much. Do you leave your comments in the chat?
Lovely to see you, Catherine. Um, 